It's my pleasure to welcome you for our second debate, Monetary Policy Transmission and the Banking System. My name is Rainer Haselmann. I'm a professor of finance here at Goethe University, and I am the new player in the team of Volkers IMFS. And um, much of our research recently has been um, about this hike in interest rate, how this transmits on banks' books and financial stability. So I am personally um, very, very interested in the insights we will gain from this session. It's my pleasure to introduce um, three very well-known and established experts in this field. Our first expert here is Governor Pablo Hernández de Cos. He's currently governor of the Banco de España and also chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Um, de Cos is president of the um, Board of Trustees of the prestigious research center SEMFI and he has a degree in law and management and a PhD from the University of Madrid. Our second expert is Maria Sunta Cianetti. She is the Katharina Martinson Professor of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. She is one of the best published academic scholars in the field banking and finance um, here in Europe, and her voice is well heard by policymakers in Europe. She has published many times in the leading finance journals and she currently is or has been associate editor of all three top um, finance journals, um, which I think is a, is, is, is a very um, special situation. And um, Professor Cianetti holds a PhD from the UCLA. Our third expert, Axel Weber, is very well known to us in Frankfurt here. He currently is the president of the Center for Financial Studies here at Goethe University. He has been chairman of the board of directors at UBS and in this role he was awarded um, the European Banker of the Year 2014. Prior he has been governor of Deutsche Bundesbank and um, he has been a professor here at Goethe University and the University of Bonn and was a visiting professor at Chicago Booth. Um, may I invite each of our three experts for an initial um, brief presentation to start our debate. Um, Governor de Coors, you may start and then we move on with Maria Sunta and Axel Weber. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rainer. Uh, great to be uh, here and see so many good uh, friends, even some old uh, bosses. Otmar is, is there. Jose Manuel is also uh, there. Um, indeed, and it was uh, mentioned also by uh, ACB President this, this morning, we've been focusing on three main issues during the last two uh, years. Uh, one, of course, was inflation. Uh, underlying inflation was the second. And the third, which was not uh, very much discussed this morning, was uh, the transmission of monetary policy. And this will be the focus of this session. And of course, it will be the focus of uh, my talk and uh, mainly related to the role that the banking uh, system has, uh, has played. Uh, I think um, it is uh, here also that there was, from the very beginning, a lot of uncertainty on how the transmission this time was going to work. Uh, and I will focus the first part of my presentation on some arguments why this was the case. Uh, the second part, I will just move to the empirical evidence that we have gathered in the last two years uh, in order to see to what extent we can really say the transmission this time was uh, stronger or not than uh, in previous uh, hiking episodes. And then uh, moving first to on financial conditions and then later on inflation and growth, on we, I can already anticipate that I think we have more evidence on the first leg of the transmission, on the second leg, on to what extent these financial conditions in the end led to higher or lower impact on growth and, and inflation, there is a still uh, high uncertainty. And I will try also to show this uh, with, uh, with the data. So in this, uh, in this table, uh, what, you, what you have is a summary uh, of some of the factors that we've all been using during the, the last two years uh, to justify that uh, the strength, uh, maybe also the speed of the monetary policy transmission mechanism in the recent uh, tightening process uh, could have been different 
okay? And I will just go very quickly uh, through them. The first one, which uh, sometimes is um, uh, forgotten, is of course related to structural uh, changes in the uh, euro area banking system in itself. So we know that banks uh, are now and were of course already uh, in 2022 uh, better capitalized uh, and display higher liquidity ratios than uh, in the past. Uh, and of course, let me uh, also say that this is mostly attributable to new regulations and the Basel regulations that were introduced during the global financial crisis. Additionally, uh, this is something that is uh, not always a stress. We also know that there is being an increase in the degree of concentration in the banking sector. And if we look back to the literature, what we also know is that according to this literature, um, greater concentration but uh, also uh, greater uh, solvency and liquidity of uh, banks uh, could tend to weaken monetary policy transmission. Okay, so that is uh, one uh, argument that I think is important to, 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 to have in mind. A second factor relates to the debt burden and the debt burden of the euro area non-financial private sector, both households and, and firms, which uh, has become less sensitive to interest rate hikes in the short run. Uh, and this is mainly because we have observed in the last decade between 2012 and 2022 uh, a decline of short-term debt and also a decline of uh, uh, debt that is at floating rates. And a case uh, uh, very evident is, is the Spanish case. Uh, I mean, Ten years ago, almost 100% of our mortgages were at floating rates. Today, the number is still very significant, around 70%, but it has declined by uh, 30 percentage points. And this has also been uh, the case for other, for other countries. Uh, third uh, uh, argument that has been used, and I think is in, important this time with an opposite sign, is that the gross debt to income uh, ratios of households are now higher than uh, they were in, in the 2000s or in the 2005, also tightening episodes. And we also know that there is a, a being a shift from bank to bond uh, funding uh, over the last decade, which would tend, in this case, to strengthen transmission. Uh, a fourth argument uh, is uh, related uh, to uh, the very accommodative uh, starting position that we have before this uh, tightening uh, cycle, which again may have uh, weakened the pass-through of market rates to deposit rates. However, we have also to take into account that there is also some uh, literature emphasizing ECB, uh, by the way, uh, papers, that cutting rates uh, to negative levels can compress term rates by more than uh, an equally uh, size cut from one positive level to, to another. And this is mainly because of frictions that encourage investors to move along the duration and also the risk scale when interest rates are negative. And of course, if you want to, to put this argument in a, in a symmetric way, you should also uh, say that, of course, raising rates from negative to zero or to positive levels could also have a disproportionate uh, tightening uh, impact on the term structure. A fifth argument is related to the housing sector. And uh, here, if you uh, just uh, go through the different reports that the European Systemic Risk Board uh, has been publishing during the last uh, seven uh, years, uh, you will see that uh, the increase in house prices in many countries was significant and there was even some signs of overvaluation in, in, many, in many countries. Uh, and in this uh, context, the tightening of monetary policy may uh, contribute to an abrupt adjustment in house prices, especially in countries with stretch valuations. And of course, we also know that housing represents a major part of household wealth uh, and also of banks' uh, assets. So this could be also an amplifier of the monetary policy transmission this uh, time. Uh, a sixth uh, argument uh, is uh, related to, to the origin of the inflationary episode. And I here I can be very brief because, of course, this was um, mentioned uh, several times this, this morning. But uh, it's clearly that adverse supply shocks uh, have played a greater role. It's not that it was only or, uh, uh, about supply, but uh, supply played a stronger role than in previous uh, hiking uh, uh, cycles. And as a result, the tightening uh, took place in a context of weak growth, growth and also high uncertainty, which uh, again may have contributed to amplifying the tightening of financing conditions through higher uh, risk premia and also higher uh, or tighter credit uh, standards. But of course, uh, the argument can be used uh, in the opposite sign because, of course, 
when the reversal of the surge in energy prices and the easing of supply chain bottlenecks took place, this can also uh, operate in the, in the, in the, op in the opposite uh, way. And then me, uh, let me also finally mention one last point, which is that the current uh, tightening cycle has been unprecedented, we know, both in uh, terms of uh, the, the magnitude, but also in terms of the, of the speed. And here, of course, the, the fear that uh, uh, some of us uh, uh, had is that uh, the possible existence of uh, non-linearities, uh, in particular those related to the deterioration of private sector balance sheets uh, that uh, in this case could have strengthened the transmission of monetary policy. Uh, all in all, uh, it's very difficult uh, to say, I mean, with this, all these arrows, green and, and red, moving in, in opposite direction, it's very uh, difficult to, to have a, a broad uh, a conclusion and a definite conclusion on this. So I think what it is relevant is to move to the empirics, what uh, we have really learned during this uh, episode. And this is uh, what I, was, uh, I will be now uh, moving uh, to. So, um, let me... Uh, give like uh, four, five, six uh, stylized facts uh, that we can get from the empirical evidence that have been obtained uh, by uh, different institutions, Bank of Spain for sure, but also the European Central Bank and, and other national central banks. The first stylized fact, uh, as uh, you can see in the uh, right uh, hand uh, chart of this slide, is that the pass-through of higher market rates to the remuneration of time deposits, and here you have to look uh, mainly to the second and the fourth blue bars, uh, in this uh, uh, slide, in this chart, has been weaker. And uh, uh, it's, it's been weaker than what would have uh, been expected on the basis of the historical regularities. So the current episode are the blue bars, and uh, what uh, it would have been expected from uh, previous uh, historical episodes is uh, these uh, um, diamonds that in this case are above the blue, uh, the blue bars. And you can even measure this, uh, this, the cumulated increase in time deposit rates observed in this uh, cycle has been around 100 basis points and 20 basis points lower for households and firms uh, respectively than the historical regularities of past hiking cycles would have suggested. So uh, at the bank, we also did an analysis of the reasons, uh, an empirical analysis of the reasons that might be behind this behavior when we took a, a pool of around uh, 100 uh, European banks and uh, we played with uh, uh, individual uh, data, but also with uh, sectoral and uh, country uh, data. And what we find uh, does, is that uh, this weak uh, pass-through uh, could be due to banks reduce funding needs to support uh, their lending given ample liquidity and weak uh, credit demand. Okay? So it was uh, this excess liquidity which has two components. The initial position, the sex liquidity was very significant, but also, as I will be showing later, that credit also uh, developed in a, uh, in a, in a very um, uh, uh, low uh, way as compared to previous, uh, uh, to previous uh, cycles. But it's not only uh, this argument that we find as relevant, also greater concentration in the banking sector played a role, and a particular case in, 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 in the, uh, of this is Spain, on which there was a significant increase in concentration in the banking sector during the last 10 years. So we find that this is a, a significant also um, variable. Uh, and, of course, we also find that the uh, remuneration of deposits was above market uh, interest rates at the beginning of the cycle, uh, reflecting uh, the reluctance of uh, banks to reduce it into negative uh, territory, also played a, a role when uh, the, the, the hiking uh, uh, started. Um, well, the, um, the second uh, conclusion, the second style I find that uh, I wanted to emphasize um, is uh, uh, now you should focus on the first blue bar uh, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this slide, where you uh, focus on house purchases or on non-financial firms, uh, you have to move to the third uh, blue bar, uh, is that uh, the average increase in interest rates on new loans for house purchases uh, has been in line with historical patterns. Here, these diamonds and the blue bars are uh, basically uh, at, the same, uh, at the same level. But in the case of new loans to non-financial corporations, which is the fourth blue bar in the chart, the pass-through has been more intense. And uh, again, you can also try to measure empirically what is the magnitude of this effect. And what we find is that the cumulated increase has been 50 basis points higher than uh, what would have been expected given uh, past uh, hiking uh, cycles. So, moving to, from prices uh, to credit standards, which is uh, what it is illustrated in this slide, what we find, and uh, I'm now uh, referring to the uh, chart on the, on the left uh, in this slide, is that credit standards uh, have tightened significantly since uh, 2022, 
Uh, and this is in contrast to the slight easing observed in the tightening cycle of 2005-2006. And um, the tightening has also been more severe than during the sovereign debt crisis, although not as sharp as during the global uh, financial uh, crisis. Um, and then, uh, of course, when we ask banks what it is behind uh, this uh, tightening uh, of credit standards, what they tell us is that uh, during the current tightening cycle, uh, this uh, um, contraction in credit supply is mainly attributable to the greater risk perceived by lenders. Uh, and this is associated with the weak macroeconomic outlook together with a deterioration in banks' perceptions of borrowers' credit worthiness. Uh, in, a, in addition, I think it's also important to, uh, to be emphasized that banks' uh, cost of funds and balance sheet constraints have also uh, contributed uh, to the tightening, although to a lesser uh, extent. And here I should also mention more empirical uh, analysis that has been done at the Bank of Spain, which basically um, finds that less capitalized banks have tightened their credit standards on loans to firms to a greater extent in the current uh, hiking cycle. And this can uh, be explained mainly but by poor capitalized banks having lower loss absorption capacity than well capitalized banks, meaning that they may be not uh, able to, to take on uh, additional uh, risk. So if I now move to, to the chart on the, on the right, this was also mentioned by, by Philip uh, this, uh, this morning, what you can get from the chart is that the tightening in credit standards coupled with uh, lower demand for funds has resulted in a market a slowdown in credit flows. Uh, which uh, since uh, end uh, 2022 has been uh, more intense than, again, historical regularities would have uh, suggested. And uh, indeed, uh, in recent years, uh, credit developments have repeatedly surprised on the downside compared to projections by, uh, based on historical patterns. And the, the, the chart on, on the right, what it is showing basically, is the, the errors that we did at the Bank of Spain trying to project uh, credit on, on the Spanish uh, economy, and it's pretty obvious the, that these uh, were very, very significant. The interesting uh, thing here is that uh, um, the analysis performed also by the ECB and also by Bank of España shows that a non-linear model taking into account not only the overall size of the rate hikes, but uh, also the size of rate hikes per unit of time gives a much better fit when trying to replicate the observed loan uh, creation uh, developments. So let me now move to, to balance sheet considerations, which of course uh, could have been also very uh, relevant in, in terms of whether we have observed or not changes in the transmission and the speed of uh, monetary policy. Uh, in terms of the impact on the financial vulnerability of households and firms, as, as it was uh, expected, uh, the increase in interest payments associated with the increase in interest rate has been much more pronounced in euro area countries with a strong prevalence of floating rate contracts or uh, shortened loans in the stock of mortgages and corporate debt. And again, Spain uh, and Italy, by the way, is a, a case uh, in point here. Uh, in this regard, uh, as shown in the, in the, in the chart, um, uh, in both charts, one is uh, for mortgages, the, 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 the right one are for uh, SMEs, um, an analysis based on the historical relationship between the probability of default of uh, loans granted by Spanish banks and the level of interest rates uh, shows some evidence of a non-linear relationship between these two variables for both uh, mortgages uh, to loans and SMEs. Um, however, and this is a, a very important uh, element to be emphasized, these effects are only sizable for very large increases in interest rates, and especially when the increase takes place in an adverse macroeconomic scenario. And this is the difference between the green and the blue, uh, uh, and the blue lines uh, there. The green is a baseline scenario, while the red uh, line is uh, showing the consequences of uh, a more adverse macroeconomic outlook. Um, well, the reality is that these two conditions have not been meant or have not been fulfilled in the current conjuncture, uh, at least in, in Spain, uh, and interest rates have uh, risen significantly, but not enough, according at least to, to, to this evidence, for the emergence of sizable non-linear uh, uh, effects uh, to, to, to emerge. Uh, by the way, we also uh, did a, a complementary analysis, also with microdata for, for Spain, that confirms um, and this is shown in this uh, chart, that the existence of a relatively linear relationship between the increase in the share of financial vulnerable uh, households and, and firms and the rise in interest uh, rates, uh, um, with the exception maybe of only 
one segment of the economy, which is uh, indebted households with below median uh, income, from which there is some evidence of a small loan linear effects once interest rates increase by more than 250 basis uh, points. Um, but, and I think this is probably one of the main conclusions that we draw from all this analysis, um, there is also the evidence, and now I'm referring to the chart on the, on the, on the left, that the strong growth in nominal income, uh, the blue bars uh, in the chart uh, uh, on the left, has slowed the increase in the percentage of vulnerable indebted households uh, and firms, which has been very muted uh, as shown by the yellow uh, diamonds uh, that are shown in the, in the chart. In the case of households, it's evident that the strong increase in income reflects both the rise of wages, as it was mentioned this, this morning, but particularly uh, of employment, which has grown by more than we were uh, expecting. And in the case of firms, sound corporate earnings has also kept the increase in the percentage of vulnerable indebted firms uh, at very moderate uh, levels, at least uh, till, uh, till now. Um, finally, before moving to the second leg of the transmission uh, mechanism, uh, let me also uh, mention that as regards the impact on the euro area banking uh, sector, the contained increase in the financial vulnerability of households and firms, as I just mentioned, is also reflected in the limited materialization of credit risk. This is probably one of the main characteristics that we have observed during the last uh, two, uh, two years. Uh, even, of course, if uh, the default rates uh, and NPLs are increasing in some sectors and ca customer uh, segments, uh, in particular commercial real estate, estate uh, SMEs and consumer uh, loans. But the conclusion is that credit risk uh, uh, still fall uh, short of the deterioration that could be expected based on historical regularities following a deterioration uh, and a very deteriorating economic outlook, higher interest rates and uh, the increases in bankruptcies that we have also uh, observed. Uh, in this regard, there is uh, also evidence that the build-up of credit risk uh, on bank balances has been dampened by banks preemptively rebalancing their loan and securities portfolio towards safer assets, which probably is a, in a, a, an indicator that the traditional financial condition indices are not showing the degree of tightening that is really happening in the economy because, of course, banks are moving to less risky uh, borrowers. Um, uh, and this is not shown in the, in the aggregate numbers. Um, and, of course, we also know that the rise in interest margins uh, as a consequence of the interest rate increases, together with the limited materialization of credit credit, has led to a recovery. Uh, not to a reduction, but to a recovery in banks' profitability, and banks have remained well capitalizing, even in some jurisdictions, uh, the level of solvency of banks have even increased, and this is, uh, again, the case of, uh, of Spain. So, the, the main conclusion that I would draw from this analysis is that uh, this, uh, this empirical evidence suggests the lack of amplification mechanisms through the banking system in the transmission of the tightening of monetary policy in the current cycle, even if there are uh, also uh, pieces of evidence that show that the transmission might, be, ha might have been uh, stronger than uh, in previous uh, hiking uh, episodes. No? So this, uh, uh, this balanced view that I think is important to, to keep in mind. So, uh, let's now move to, to the second part, and here I will be uh, um, uh, more brief than, than in the first part, because I think we have uh, still plenty of analysis to, to, be, uh, to be done. Uh, to what extent these tighter financial conditions uh, have been transmitted uh, to activity, to employment, and to, and to prices? This is uh, probably the big uh, question. Um, so let me focus on some pieces of evidence that, again, uh, I'm not uh, saying that these pieces of evidence provide a, a definite conclusion, but at least some indication of what uh, has uh, uh, been uh, happening these years. First, it is illustrated, and it was also illustrated by Philip uh, this morning, since the start of the current monetary policy tightening cycle, the euro system uh, macro projections have systematically overestimated GDP growth. And uh, we also know, uh, it was also emphasized by Philip, that these uh, downward surprises do not seem uh, to be fully explained by errors in the um, technical, the so-called uh, external assumptions, including, by the way, the, the degree of tightening of monetary policy that was initially expected by market or the stance of uh, fiscal policy. Even controlling, okay, but uh, for changes in, in monetary and fiscal policy stance, we cannot explain, no, there is a still uh, a residual that it is uh, significant. And we know that in these projections, the, generally, the impact of financial variables on activity and inflation is largely based on historical uh, correlations and also on linear models. 
uh, and therefore uh, this evidence uh, might be signaling a stronger transmission of monetary policy to macroeconomic variable, uh, variables than, than in the past. Okay? But, uh, of course, uh, we cannot rule out that there are other factors apart from uh, monetary policy that uh, may also explain these systematic errors in the projections. And um, here uh, is where I want to emphasize the second uh, element of the errors that we've been committing on the macro outlook, which is uh, putting, of course, the focus on employment. The labor market clearly has demonstrated remarkable resilience. It was emphasized this morning also by several speakers. Um, uh, remarkable resilience over the past two years, again illustrated in this uh, chart by lower than expected unemployment rates compared to staff projections. Uh, uh, the projections, they have uh, been directionally uh, correct in predicting a slowdown in employment growth, um, but uh, the latter, uh, this uh, employment uh, uh, slowdown has been much uh, uh, higher uh, than, uh, than expected, uh, uh, much lower than, than expected, so meaning the, the errors that we have committed on the unemployment rate, also taking into account the evolution of participation rate, has been uh, uh, negative. Um, and the persistent underestimation of employment could be attributed to, 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 to some extent, I, I, I wouldn't uh, um, be in a position to say to great extent, but to some extent to labor hoarding. Uh, but I want to emphasize this point because this is what connects with uh, the lack of deterioration of the balance sheets, in particular of households, that I was trying to show in the, in the previous part of my uh, presentation. Uh, and importantly, I, I wouldn't uh, um, be uh, making this point in a very strong way because Philip made it uh, in a very nice way this morning. In the case of inflation, we also know that uh, Euro system projection errors uh, were significant in 2022, and then um, their accuracy has significantly improved since the end of uh, 2022, uh, uh, so meaning 2023 and the first months of uh, 2023, uh, 2024. Uh, but, and this is what it is important, uh, projection errors have been mainly mainly related to surprises in energy commodity prices and global supply chain disruptions, including, of course, not only the direct effect, but also the transmission of these uh, uh, errors in, in, in commodity prices and global supply, supply uh, chain evolutions into core, into core inflation. Uh, and then the last point I wanted to make is uh, what it is illustrated in this uh, chart, which is uh, some evidence that has been uh, also developed by, by Banco de España staff, which basically is a recursive estimate of uh, the impact of non, and I would underline this, non-systematic monetary policy shocks by means of uh, a structural BAR model, which is basically showing, as you uh, see, in the left-hand uh, uh, chart of, the, uh, of this uh, slide, that the transmission of monetary policy to GDP growth and inflation, uh, which are the continuous uh, uh, red lines in both uh, charts, would have been somewhat more intense than the, that observed on average before this unprecedented tightening cycle. But this is especially the case for growth, whereas the evidence for inflation is much more or less uh, conclusive. So um, with this, let me try to draw some uh, conclusions of all these pieces of, uh, of evidence that uh, I've been trying to, to describe today. Um, in my view, uh, this evidence suggests that the transmission of the current monetary policy tightening cycle to private sector funding conditions ha has been forceful, as we've been emphasizing at the governing council, and in some cases, stronger than could be expected on the basis of historical regularities. That's the first point. By contrast, there is no evidence of amplification effects through the banking system linked to the deterioration of private sector balance sheets. Uh, the strong growth in the nominal income of households and, of course, also of firms seems to have limited the impact of uh, uh, credit risk. Uh, and the positive evolution of employment has played a crucial role in this regard. I should also mention that the fact that banks were also in a very good position in terms of liquidity and solvency given the implementation of the Basel III reforms that, as you perfectly know, in Europe it was applied to all banks, independently of their size, has also, in my view, played a very significant role in this regard. Um, as to the second stage of monetary policy transmission, some of the available empirical evidence might be signaling a stronger transmission to aggregate demand. However, we have persistently underestimated employment growth and we do not find conclusive evidence of a differential impact of our monetary policy on inflation in comparison with previous uh, tightening uh, cycles. And all in all, this analysis, in my view, confirms that a stronger than expected monetary policy impact remains a downside risk to euro area growth outlook, as mentioned repeatedly uh, in our uh, monetary policy statements. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and the floor is now to Maria Sunter. If I can have uh, my slides, yes. So I um, thank you for uh, having me, and uh, I will uh, talk at, um, about what I see one of um, the missing uh, elements uh, in uh, the discussion about uh, the transmission mechanism of monetary policies through banks. In particular, in the past few years, we have been uh, op central banks have been operating with uh, a lot of excess liquidity. Now that the monetary tightening uh, has started, uh, the hope is that uh, it won't matter for uh, the way in which a bank lands. Most of the concerns have been uh, uh, focused on uh, short-term money markets. But uh, is that true? There is uh, very little um, academic literature, and uh, I would say that uh, results are, uh, and also conjectures, are uh, disparate. On the one hand, uh, excess liquidity reserves uh, are uh, an asset for a bank. So if there are a lot out there for a given size of a bank balance sheet, Reserves, uh, could, excess reserves uh, could just uh, displace lending. In that case, uh, we could have uh, that, uh, well, quantitative tightening uh, actually um, improves uh, the extent of bank lending. But on the other hand, we know that uh, reserves, uh, central bank liquidity, are very special. They are the only assets whose value would never change. Silicon Valley Bank wouldn't have gone under had it held reserves instead of U.S. treasuries. So why does that matter for lending? Well, I view banks as solving a portfolio problem given their cost of capital. And uh, what uh, is uh, the main concern of a bank? Well, the main concern of a bank uh, is uh, a liquidity shock. So if uh, there are, uh, if uh, a bank that finds optimal uh, to hold relatively more uh, excess reserves could be better insured against liquidity shocks and to some extent be more willing to extend loans that are the most illiquid asset and uh, expose uh, the bank to more negative shocks in the future. Take another bank that uh, perhaps has a higher cost of capital. For a bank that has a higher cost of capital, holding uh, reserves in the balance sheet is expensive. Why? Well, to pay for these uh, extreme, you have to pay for the extreme security, so the reserves tend to have a lower yield. So what would this bank with relatively high cost of capital do? Well, it would economize on the share of the balance sheet it, it devotes to reserves, hold relatively more security, and at the same time contract the loan supply. So on this other more complex story that relies on bank portfolio optimization and differences in cost of capital, I offered you a mechanism in which excess reserves and the bank lending are actually complementary. So taking away lots of excess reserves from certain banks may actually lead to a contraction in lending. Now, these are theoretical mechanisms, and uh, what uh, you realize is that they are very hard to test, because also in my story, the story I was giving you, is that the banks uh, choose optimally. In my story, I had an observable, the cost of capital, but we don't know what are the bank's uh, investment opportunities, uh, what is uh, the organizational structure that demand for security, and so on. So the reason why these uh, channels uh, are uh, to some, somewhat uh, understudied is that they are very hard to test. So I want to be able to test them with uh, new data either, but uh, in uh, joint work with co-authors at the ECB, and I believe that uh, Carlo Altavilla is uh, somewhere here, we have been using a policy experiment to try to shed some lights on this mechanism. So 
So I will tell you very briefly what we actually do, what are our findings, and then what are the implications for quantitative tightening. So what do we want from the policy uh, experiment? Well, we want that some banks increase their reserve holdings for exogenous reasons that are not driven by shocks to their lending opportunity. What is this shock? Well, it was the introduction of the tiering during the periods on negative interest rate policy rate. And uh, that was first hinted uh, actually at this conference in uh, 2019 by then uh, President Bar Mario Draghi. So what uh, does uh, the tiering do? Well, uh, with the tiering, um, uh, the European Central Bank granted exemption from the negative policy rates to some banks, but not to others. The exemptions were a multiple of a minimum reserve requirements. So by construction, the policy was increasing the marginal return on reserves for banks that had ex ante relatively lower reserve holdings. So these are potentially the banks that were relatively less insured against the liquidity shocks. <coughs> In this context, we ask, do we see a reallocation of reserves and what are the effects on bank lending? So let's look at first at what happens. So this graph shows you what is the distribution of reserves before and after the implementation of the theory. So what you observe is that the, gir the curves before um, up to October 2019 are very spread out. So most of these excess reserves were concentrated in France, Germany, but uh, at the periphery of uh, the euro area, there were relatively lower reserve holdings. What do we observe after the introduction of uh, the tiering? Well, we see that uh, the distribution of uh, reserves becomes much more concentrated, and you see from uh, the curves becoming higher. There is a higher fraction of uh, banks that holds uh, a given amount of reserves. And actually the policy was to some extent very successful because all banks were filling their exemptions. So what was happening here, and uh, of course we do much more analysis in the paper, but the way in which we interpret this evidence is that the demand for reserves from some banks increased. The banks that went to the money market to obtain more reserves are banks that were facing ex ante higher interest rate in the money market. By the sign, the policy didn't change aggregate interest rate. The interest rate on the particular money market borrowing of those banks did not change. But these banks were exposed funding optimal to increase their excess liquidity holdings because they had a higher interest rate on those uh, uh, holdings. So, this is, we interpret this as an exogenous reallocation of excess reserves due to the policy. What is the main feature that is important for us? We can assume that this is not closely related to the investment opportunity faced by these banks. So in this context, we can, we can ask, does this matter for, for uh, bank lending? And if we are agnostic, ex ante, it could be that for these banks it's easier to have a zero rate without doing anything and without doing, uh, extending any loans. 
Well, what do we observe? You see he, he, here that we plot the um, dynamic of uh, the bank lendings. And uh, um, the last, uh, um, uh, the last uh, uh, period after uh, the last line is the period that, that captures the implementation of the theory. Of course, uh, we stop in, uh, uh, at the beginning of 2020 because we don't want to have the COVID shock in our, uh, uh, in our sample. So what do you observe here? Well, you observe that banks that had exempted more unused exemptions are extending more credit with respect to the other banks in our sample. Now you may ask, well, but if you are saying that having more excess reserves seem to be positively related to bank lending, are you also saying that uh, the banks that were transferring the reserve holdings were contracting credit? Is that these are a distribution of credit? Well, based also on work that has been carried out at uh, the Federal Reserve Board, the way in which we think of this demand of reserves uh, and the effect of, res uh, of reserves on uh, bank access to insurance uh, is that uh, above to certain level, banks uh, have uh, a sort of uh, cessation points. Banks with very, very high reserves probably do not benefit from uh, having even more excess liquidity. So, in principle, according to our theoretical framework, we think that these are the banks that were tr transferring reserves through the money market. Of course, the data can help us to check whether this is true. If, for, if the banks with a lot of excess liquidity had not reached their cessation point, we should observe that since they were relatively more exposed to liquidity shock, they should have decreased lending. And uh, we can check that in the data. We, ob we do not observe that uh, banks with uh, high excess liquidity in excess of their exemptions change their lending policy. So all of the changes that you observe in this particular graph are driven by banks that had relatively ex ante, relatively low excess liquidity, that is the banks with unused exemptions. In the paper, we do some uh, back of the envelope calculation. So if you think of during this period of the average increase in bank loans of banks with a news exemption, we observe a total increase in bank credit of 31 billion. And remember, at that point, this was something that we wanted to stimulate. So now let's come to uh, uh, quantitative tightening. Of course, I don't have this in the sample, and uh, I cannot apply a similar methodologies. The banks that are decreasing their excess liquid holdings more than others are doing so based on some information and portfolio optimization that I cannot solve. But uh, I can draw some conclusions on what to expect from quantitative tightening. And uh, the way in which I view it is that uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, very hard to predict. So the implication of our paper is that, uh, well, excess liquidity may increase bank lending if it is held by banks that uh, have uh, uninsured liquidity shocks. But what happens when central banks engage in liquidity tightening? Well, we know that excess liquidity is decreasing, but we don't know from where it's coming. That's not what uh, can be done through the open market operations. 
And uh, if you extrapolate from our finding, uh, conclusion is, well, if the banks that are decreasing their excess liquidity holdings are banks that are extremely liquidity rich, that are banks that are beyond their satiation points, well, we do not expect much. This is uh, precisely what uh, policymakers would uh, hope. On the other hand, if this uh, quantitative tightening ends up uh, decreasing the liquid holdings of banks that have ex ante lower, a lower amount of excess reserves. Well, uh, we might observe that uh, the amount of outstanding credit uh, decreases more uh, dramatically with uh, stronger effects uh, on uh, the negative stance of monetary policy. So um, this is, of course, uh, we would need uh, to perform uh, an analysis with uh, more current data, but I think that is useful uh, to think uh, of uh, theory and uh, is also useful uh, to think of these uh, missing uh, elements when uh, we think about uh, the current implementation of uh, monetary policy. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, let me uh, chime in to those that uh, welcome everyone here again. And Volker, thank you for the invitation uh, to be at the conference. I'm very happy to see Otmar in the room, uh, who jointly with me started this some 24 years ago. So very happy to contribute after a long journey, not in Frankfurt. Uh, I'm going to talk about three issues. Uh, I've been put on a bit of a technical panel, so I won't be too fundamentally critical of central banks. But I have one slide in the end that is a bit more fundamental criticism, and I want to add that to the discussion. Uh, but my task was more to talk about the area that I worked in for the last 10 years, which is banks and the transmission of monetary policy. Now, what I'm going to talk about is two things that matter. One is quantities, liquidity, and the other one is price, which is interest rates. And I think there is a difference between how price and quantity transmit into the monetary policy. And I very much felt reminded of my own situation when Rich Kreider this morning said that he uh, misses the eager staff uh, at his former institution that do nice craft. I see Arndt sitting here in the room. He recognized one or two slides that I borrowed from UBS because I too have no eager staff that prepares good slides. The team at UBS that I worked with for 10 years is, is one of the really outstanding research teams. Uh, and I must say, I'm, I'm frequently using what, what they produce. I'm not always of the same opinion, but I use what they use. If you look at the market, you can see here uh, three distinct phases. The one is the red line I want to focus on is the aggregate central bank balance sheet of the US, Federal Reserve, the Eurozone, Japan, and China. And basically, the first wrap-up, the red line, up to 2018 was QE1, QE2, QE3, all these quantitative easing programs. And then there was a pre-crisis, pre-COVID stabilization at a higher level of a balance sheet of all central banks. Uh, quantitative tightening was a theoretical discussion. It didn't happen. And then COVID struck, and we've seen a massive increase in fiscal expenditure. 25% of GDP in terms of paychecks and fiscal expenditure financed largely by a similar size 27% augmentation of central bank's balance sheet and the whole thing wrapped up and then 2022 which was a bad year for banks is the first year where actually we started seeing central bank balance sheets coming off and you could see that the stock market reacted pretty much in the same predictable way. There, there are some lags. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. But if you look over time between the S&P and the MSCI and some of the global liquidity measures, there's clearly an indication that excess liquidity produced by the central banks largely didn't make it into the real economy. It stayed in the financial system and drove asset prices and financial markets as opposed to being transmitted first order with big effects on output and inflation. So let me throw some water into the wine when central banks say we achieved a lot in the real economy. You achieved a lot for guys like me, who's been a banker for 10 years, much less you achieved in the real economy. 
Second, uh, well, please, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being populist here. Uh, the second point is, and I took this from the FT, is what we're now seeing is central banks are actually about to tighten. What the FT conveniently misses out here is Japan because it doesn't fit the picture. Japan has been, as until yesterday, been on an expansionary, ultra-expansionary policy far outnumbering the expansion of any of the other central banks. As of yesterday, they started raising rates and they will reduce liquidity. So what, and this is the chart I borrowed from Arndt, what will happen, as an example, with the ECB balance sheet is you come from a period and there's these different colors, this letter soup of programs which the ECB intervened, and I portray it as liquidity when needed, always when needed, amply to solve problems. And as of now, going forward, at least the shorter term and longer term repo operations, which run out if they're not prolonged, have been taken back. Actually, I always saw that that, when I was still in the central bank, was a good instrument to provide liquidity without a long-term commitment. Now, the easy tightening is done, which is the LTROs and the borrowing has rolled off. Now, it's the harder stuff. It's what you bought. It's what you own, what sits on your balance sheet, and what might cause losses if you sell it, because the prices have changed from a low interest rate environment to a higher one. So that part is going to be more a glacial almost deterministic liquidity reduction that can be calculated with, but in a non-disturbing way, you try and be as deterministic and as predictable as you can be on quantitative tightening, because any discretionary move there might surprise the market. And actually what you see here, and I, I agree with our economists at UBS, is that process will not go on forever. There will actually, and here, the, you know, it's as of next year maybe, central banks might actually start facing the fact that they've by now become the central counterparty for many financial institutions in the market. We've blown out the money market, the interbank market. It is impossible for central bank to do, and I borrowed a chart from Isabel here, uh, to do uh, what is projected here, namely to go back with all of the liquidity on the central bank balance sheet is made up of cash in circulation. We do need a central bank system that continues to hold reserves for banks as a buffer on liquidity shocks. And actually there are two ways to do that. Five years ago I was at the Bank of England on a panel with Mervyn King. And the Bank of England, and in particular under Mark Carney, has developed the concept of basically uh, a non-discretionary allowance of not just banks, but other parties to access the central bank balance sheet. They call it constructive ambiguity as opposed to constructive, uh, sorry, constructive clarity as opposed to constructive ambiguity, where it's unclear whether you allow for other players that are non-banks to access your balance sheet. So, you know, like you asked before in the question, where will this end? I think it will end earlier than is mapped out here, and it will basically lead to the insight that central banks have now assumed such a central counterparty role in money markets and in many bank funding markets that it's very hard to step away. A lot of text, I don't go into that. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is financial conditions. Let me show you, this is the US Federal Reserve hikes. We've seen the fastest, steepest, and globally most synchronized rate hike cycle in post-war history. We're six months into the end of that rate hike cycle, and everyone expects interest rate to fall. How bogus can you be? This will not happen, because there's a lot of pipeline risk that will map out over the next two to three years through the financial system and through the economy that will not make it a wise decision for central banks to move early and reduce rates. Because the worst thing they can do, and Paul, uh, and this was mentioned actually by the chairman of the Federal Reserve in his speech in Jackson Hole, the worst thing to do is to reverse course. Because you get surprises by inflation data. And so central banks will try and see it in the rear mirror that inflation is down to a reasonable level rather than have it in the projections, which was the modus operandi going forward. And it was talked about before, I heard Philip as well, there are many reasons why the projections were wrong, none of them were with the ECB, okay, fine, but uh, there are a couple of reasons why these projections were wrong. This has been the ECB rate hike, 
the steepest, most sharpest, and highest. And this is the global picture. Everyone's on the way up. So we've seen a single experiment of a massive increase in interest rate and tighter conditions in financial markets that will now map out. And again, a lot of text, I'm not going to go in that. What will, you, what will you see? The first signal of transmission that you saw in the financial system was here, a US banks started to have problems. Why? Not because of the black line that was above zero, but of the bars that are below. When you have a massive increase in interest rates and bond prices fall as a result of that, any previous credit you've issued at zero rates, any bond price of anything you bought under that zero rate environment has to be adjusted to a new return calculus and you realize mark to market losses. Now, when banks need to realize such massive short term losses in their balance sheet, they try and avoid it. It's perfectly natural. And regulation gives them a single avenue to do that. You move your impaired assets that have basically here unrealized losses from the trading book where they're marked to market to the banking book where you hold them to maturity. And then you pray. You <laughs> pray that nothing happens to maturity that forces you to sell any of these assets because if you do have to sell them, you're actually realizing these losses that you just insulated your balance sheet for. So, banking is about risk management, not about religion. You shouldn't pray, you should manage risks. And many banks haven't done that very well. Here's an example of what went wrong in financial markets when some of the US banks failed. And again, remember what I'm trying to say. Quantity is massive and the idea is to reduce this. Interest rates are at the highest in a short period of time and the idea is to reduce that as well. When we had financial stress, there was a de facto tightening in the US market of financial conditions to the tune of 1.5% of an additional rate hike that hadn't actually happened, but simply happened through the reaction of markets by tightening credit standards and conditions. And uh, that made, in my view, a much tighter policy when these financial stresses occurred. And the question was, well, how will that go on? I particularly took the charts from that time rather than adding the future. And you can also see that what central banks do is the natural thing, and it's right to do that, inject emergency liquidity massively. Everyone that needs liquidity gets it. And so you undid more than 50% of the quantitative tightening that had already occurred through a massive injection of emergency liquidity, but structural liquidity is reliable and with you for a long time. Emergency liquidity is very short term and therefore not a savior, it's just an adhesive tape that helps you get over the problems. It's not reliable for long. So you need to replace that as a bank having just been saved by other forms of liquidity. If you look at deposits, and you know, again, problems in finance are always the same. The runs start with deposits. Deposits are the guys that give money to banks and are happy to get zero return on it for short term. They're not so happy, but they still do it, because otherwise I don't understand why overnight deposits are still not remunerated. Term deposits do get remunerated. But when you look at deposits, what we've just seen in the US banking system has been the biggest bank run in terms of deposits affected in institutions that were subject to a run that we've seen in post-war history. So don't take this as a benign, oh, we just scraped through. We scraped through, that's true. But well, we had to do something completely unusual and something we promised we would never do again if I put myself back into my Bundesbank chair. We guaranteed the entire system, all deposits in the US, flat out. Not just insured deposits, everything. That is not monetary policy, that's an insurance policy. And it's a free insurance for everyone. That's not, in my view, going to be repeated infinitely times. If you look at what happened here, what banks do, they tighten credit standards and they get emergency liquidity to ride out any storm. They don't care about the cost of liquidity. They actually want liquidity to sit on their balance sheet. And that's a problem. This is what happened at our friendly neighbor Credit Suisse, who's now part of UBS. I used to be chairman of UBS, so uh, I'm not going to comment on UBS and Credit Suisse, as you can understand because I've got lawyers behind me every time when I say anything on this area. 
But uh, you could see that at least there was a massive loss in confidence in Credit Suisse leadership, and they had roughly a halving of their deposits within a short period of a couple of months. And if you look at the US more regional banks, there's a pretty similar phenomenon when deposits went out of those, much more pronounced than with the systemic banks. Actually, you had this adverse development that because they were systemic, the systemic large banks in the US were seen as safe havens because they could not be allowed to go under, and therefore with risky smaller banks, everyone moved their money into the big banks. Again, something that I hear myself say 10 years ago we wouldn't do again, it happened again. Why did it happen? Well, you can see, you know, I read a lot of these stories that Twitter and social media caused a lot of that. I think that's complete nonsense. You try and move money on a weekend, uh, you're soon up to your deposit limit. You will need weeks to move it uh, unless you call your guy. So this whole story about media, no, what you can do, and that is simple, if you have money in a bank and it's risky, you put a security number on it and invest it into a product like a money market fund. And actually, at that time, it happened massively. That's the red line. Deposits went down. And it wasn't such a stupid move because if you look here, what the money markets paid, which is the yellow line for deposits, and what the banks paid, you would have been stupid not to do it. So, don't be surprised that clients of banks get it if there is a problem with trust in the bank. The fastest thing out of the door are your clients and your assets. So this is a vulnerability we haven't overcome. It's still there. And what I talked about now is all of these things can be explained in idiosyncratic way, and I'm going to do that right now. But I hear occasionally that, yes, the US had its problems, and yes, Switzerland had its problems. We're fine in the euro area. Don't tell me that euro area banks don't make idiosyncratic mistakes. Mistakes are there for the Americans and the Swiss. We Europeans do better. That would be quite a perception. Here's why these banks had problems. These banks had problems because they did three or four things wrong that you don't get wrong in banking if you have any idea about banking. The first thing is you don't have very narrow, concentrated client base and business risk. If you look at Silvergate, almost all of the deposits were crypto-based. If you look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, by the way, always a target bank that we at UBS looked at, it's the billionaire bank in the billionaire Silicon Valley. They were fantastic market value. We could never afford to buy them till nobody wanted to afford to buy them. And what happened was that the core of their Underlying deposits came from tech entrepreneurs and venture capital, and so it was a very concentrated regional business model with a certain industry using money there and banking with them. And actually, you can talk about Credit Suisse and also First Republic. Their core banking was wealth management. And if wealth management clients who are millionaires and billionaires that have bank money with a bank lose trust in a bank, they're very savvy to move that money fast. And so if you have a very concentrated, narrow business model with an over-reliance on a certain number of clients in a particular area, you are susceptible to bank runs. Diversified banks, broad-based deposits, long maturity structures, not a problem. Concentration risk is a problem. And mark to market, people say, well, you know, it's not a problem. But if you actually impact the values of capital at some of the US banks that had unrealized losses, Silicon Valley Bank is the outlier here, you actually burn all the entire regulatory capital they have if you adjust the unrealized losses in terms of a realized impact on their capital. So had they been subject to stress tests, which they weren't because the US carved them out of uh, GCFE regulation, you would have seen under the first stress test that basically these banks, even without stress, just putting the status quo into the balance sheet onto the capital would have run close to the zero line. And if you stressed that scenario, you would have seen very, very quickly that these banks had a capital problem and they also had a concentration problem in the sense that if you look at here, deposits, the US has a deposit insurance limit of 500,000 for a married couple, 250,000 for individuals. SVB Bank 
had 93.8% of deposits, because it's the billionaires from Silicon Valley, were uninsured because they were above that limit. Well, and therefore, they were quite sensitive to whether the outcome of the FDIC negotiations was all deposits get guaranteed or just guaranteed deposits get guaranteed. So they started to run. That has changed. Banks are now bringing down, and that's the chart I'm trying to share with you here, the uninsured deposits to move to the short deposits. And actually what you, try and, what you see here is the share of, the, of insured deposits in US banks is increasing massively. And I would say, in the end, we're going to move to a system where unsecured deposits are really not held in any proportion relative to the secured deposits. Which leads me to my final point on this issue, which is, so if the US system was saved by the FDIC and a federal deposit insurance had stepped in and took over some banks and sold them at a price, we're all not so greatly in favor of federal deposit insurance in Europe, because we haven't moved a single dot on creating a European deposit insurance scheme, who's going to step in if we have idiosyncratic failures? It's not going to be that easy, not going to be that quickly resolved. So I agree with you, we don't have problems yet, but again, to the praying, let's pray we don't get any because we're in much less of a position to deal with the problems. My last question I'm going to pose with you is, you see all these gray bars, every time rates were high, Eight out of the past U.S. rate reductions came with a recession. We just heard from the ECB, we're not going to be in a recessionary environment. And I believe actually the U.S. economy, Richard Clarida talked about it, it's pretty clear that the U.S. is quite resilient. So rule out for now that there is a hard landing and a recession. Well, the other reasons why rate were, rates were reduced was financial distress. And the question you simply have to ask yourself is, do I add a gray bar at the end of that diagram or not. I think it's way too early to tell. I think we'll probably need two to three years, both on the price transmission into the real economy to say whether we can lower rates or not, or on the financial distress. And the last thing I want to uh, basically leave you with is this issue I talked about, about the idiosyncratic nature of failure. You can really see that quite well. You know, when I was at UBS, we always looked at Credit Suisse, their share price and their ratio of to book value. And what you can see, even against that yellow line, which is the European average of banks, and I'm not going to boast by saying UBS was trending up relative to the European uh, average, you see there was a continuous decay in the perception of markets of Credit Suisse's ability to manage their risk. And so, you know, to some degree, there was a surprise factor at the very end with this startup. up But the, there was a lot of idiosyncratic risks materializing. There's Archegos risk, there's a Greensill case, there's many other cases that basically led to a prolonged decay in the perception of that bank man managing risk uh, quite well, which is, in my view, an important aspect uh, to, to talk about. But again, for me, uh, all of these crises that we saw were idiosyncratic. All of them can be explained by a very few mistakes you don't make usually in banking. Bad risk management, concentration risk, too high leverage, the usual suspects. But don't let us assume that we're safe just because we haven't seen any idiosyncratic risk materialize in any of the European continental banks. That would be, in my view, a step too far and clearly an expectation too early. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. We've seen three different perspectives with all um, novel insights to me. And um, we move on now with the um, lead questions. And due to time, we would always also collect them in one round. Andreas Billmeier is the first. So thank you very much for all the presentations. I, I, I thought that the panel um, could have essentially uh, wrapped up after the first slide of Governor Hernandez de Cos because that, that had everything that we needed to know about the banking transmission. Um, I wanted to come back um, to where you left it, uh, and that is sort of uncertainty about the second leg and a question about sort of downside risks to the economic outlook. Um, 
President Lagarde said this morning that essentially um, wages, um, corporate profit margins, um, and productivity need to play into each other, need to go hand in hand to enable a clearer view of the, of the policy cycle. And I think um, the question that I have from a bank transmission um, perspective is, what is the impact on that, on the, one of the three factors, which is presumably corporate profitability and corporate profit margins where bank transmission can do the most relative to the others. And um, I guess what I would like to ask is whether you can go a little bit deeper into that and um, because ultimately we need to make an assumption on that trajectory for corporate profitability or corporate profit margins and how do you think about that in the context of the specific bank transmission? Okay, thank you. Jens Eisenschmidt. Yeah, also thank you from my side. I have three questions, three uh, presenters. I'll try to be short. First one for Governor de Kos. Uh, uh, you saw or you presented uh, basically um, a holistic view on transmission, both on factors mitigating it or strengthening it. Um, have you thought about, I mean, there's one thing uh, I'm wondering, of course, these things are learned on the history in terms of you typically benchmark this against previous tightening cycles. We didn't really have all the new regulation that we got since then, so that must have an impact also on, on bank transmission. Um, and then related to that, what about the factors that are transitory and the factors that are not? I'm thinking, for instance, about, say, excess liquidity declining and at some point becoming essentially a binding constraint. And this is not then something where you can expect that maybe going forward, in particular if you also add regulation, transmission becomes even stronger. Um, I mean, as a risk factor, just to sort of, because, you know, you, you observe an average that's more or less the same like in historical episodes, but you have many factors that are going in a different direction and you don't know about the persistence of each of the factors. Question for the academic here uh, on the paper, how can you uh, disentangle uh, two effects? I think you made the case for a liquidity effect essentially for bank lending. Um, what about an effect that you basically have an equity uh, constraint alleviated simply because the tiering system was a transfer from public sector to the private sector um, and those that actually benefited from it have a higher NPV so basically they should sort of lend more. I mean, that's what you expect and your control group is not very well defined in terms of you don't know who actually lent and whether they had a binding equity constraint. And then final question to the former policymaker. Um, suppose we buy into exactly um, that description of the world is essentially there's an overinsurance out there. So what's the policy prescription following from that? Thank you. Dirk Schumacher. Yep, thank you also from my side for uh, very interesting slides and presentations. I would have a question on fragmentation uh, across country lines. It used to be a big problem in the euro area, particularly the debt crisis, that the monetary impulse wouldn't be uh, transferred or transmitted equally across countries. And ECB came up with quite a few instruments to uh, eliminate that. A question is, this doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. Is it still, or what, could it become an issue? And if it, will not, why? Why are the differences between the countries these days so much smaller? Debt levels are not necessarily uh, having converged, uh, quite the opposite. So why does fragmentation not really matter anymore? Yari Steen. So Governor de Kos showed um, very nicely that tighter monetary policy has transmitted quite strongly into financing conditions and also that there's been um, a, a drag on activity. Um, but there's a range of views on how persistent that drag on activity is going to be. So some cite long lags um, and say a lot of drag is still in the pipeline. Other people are saying that we've seen uh, significant easing in financial conditions recently and this drag on growth will diminish very quickly. Um, what do you think about that issue and, and what does it mean? Um, what does it imply for the appropriate speed at which policy rates are eventually lowered? I would suggest you answer in the order like the presentations have been given. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, many questions were for me, so I, I will try to maybe starting with the, with the last one. I mean, this is something that you can measure to a certain extent, but it is still pending. So you already knew at the beginning of uh, 2022 the percentage of households that had floating rates 
or you also knew the percentage of households whose mortgage was going to be uh, updated in, in one year, in two three years, in three years, in four years. So this is something that you can already uh, estimate. In the case of the mortgage market, it's a still a significant part is still pending in countries, for example, Germany, as compared to Spain, on which the transmission is very quick, uh, is still uh, pending a, a significant amount. Um, in the case of firms, you can also make this estimate because, of course, you know also the structure of short-term versus uh, long-term uh, debt. Um, and, uh, and there you can claim that, yes, indeed, there has been um, a significant uh, that has already uh, happened. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, given uh, the volumes of credit that we have observed, if at some point firms need to finance liquidity issues or uh, hopefully investment uh, needs, of course, this, the level of interest rates that we will be paying will be higher. So in, again, my, my conclusion that there is still a, a significant part uh, pending. Okay. Then I mean, coming to, to Andrea's, uh, Andrea's point, I was, uh, when, when preparing the presentation, uh, I was uh, thinking about incorporating a, a, an additional slide that in the end I decided not to, not to, to incorporate because it was already too, too lengthy, uh, which is something that not very often we pay sufficient attention which is the central scenario in our stress test. So we always put the emphasis in communication on the severe scenario. So but what happens with uh, profitability, uh, resilience, solvency of banks in the central scenario? Um, uh, this is an exercise that uh, we always do and we publish in our, uh, for the Spanish banks in the financial stability report in, in Oton. And uh, well, the reality is that if the central macro scenario that we are projecting for the Spanish economy, and I would say that it would be very similar for uh, European the economy and European banks, banks in, in three years time will have more capital. So the central scenario that we have today is, is positive for the banks. Still the impact on interest rate margins, although declining, will, will be there. And, uh, Given that, as it was mentioned this morning, we are not expecting a very significant increase in unemployment rate, even in the Spanish case, we are um, projecting a, a, a decline, not a very significant one, but, but a decline. Credit risk, at least on the, on the, on the mortgage market, will remain, uh, will remain uh, low. Um, and uh, since growth will be above potential, it's already the output gap in the Spanish economy is above, uh, above zero. It will be uh, increasingly uh, positive, and this means that in terms of the profitability of, of non-financial corporates, uh, the, the, the scenario will be reasonable. Um, of course, then if you want to, to move to the severe scenario, this is different, okay, for sure. But, um, but in terms, uh, and, and you were linking this question to, to, to the points that were made by President Lagarde this, this morning, well, aquí, uh, uh, here, the, if, you, uh, if you think about, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the puzzles that was very much discussed this morning, and I think we don't have a definite answer, is why employment has been so resilient. So if you think that this is all about um, labor hoarding, then I guess there are two scenarios, and both of them, in principle, are good for, uh, for inflation, which is, okay, it is labor hoarding, Economy recovers, but of course it would be less intensive in employment because the workers are already in the companies, so labor productivity will improve, unit labor costs will moderate, um, and that uh, will be a, an important uh, effect in, or, in, uh, in order to, uh, to, to slow down uh, inflation. If it, this is not the case, and then uh, these shocks are not uh, so temporary, and they become more permanent, then I guess what we should be observing is a significant increase in, in unemployment. And then you will have an increase in labor productivity, but for the bad reasons. So in terms of inflation, you will also observe an, uh, an slowdown, at least that, that it is coming from, uh, you need, uh, from you need labor cost. And then finally, uh, on Yuri's uh, point, um, I mean, perhaps uh, if I try to, to answer to, to, to your question is, so for me, the, the big question mark here is, okay, we have observed, I've, presented a, a lot of evidence on this, that um, the transmission on lending has been higher. Okay, that's clear. But at the same time, we have not observed, I mean, we have observed an impact on, 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 on growth, although the link between these two variables is not obvious. 
Okay, because, for example, when you look at the decomposition, I didn't mention it in the, in the presentation, but when you look at the decomposition of the, of the errors, uh, controlling for the assumptions, private investment and private consumption is not playing a very significant role. Okay, it's basically uh, exports, so which is not so much linked in principle with monetary policy transmission. So it's not that you can make the, very strongly the argument that the transmission has been more forceful uh, or as compared to historical. Um, but okay, let's just take that the evolution of, uh, of lending has been very low. Uh, at some point, uh, this might create some non-linearities on, on investment and consumption that we are not observing in the data, maybe also because the savings ratios of both households and firms were very significant during, uh, during the pandemic. And this is a variable that perhaps we have not paid sufficient, we paid a, a lot of attention in 2022 and 2021, but with maybe declining intensity. And this is a, perhaps a, a variable that we have to look more carefully, because if the reality is that the savings are uh, now uh, much, uh, much lower, or they are less liquid, because for example, households have invested a significant part of this in housing, for example, then uh, the evolution of lending and this uh, negative evolution of lending might have uh, more effects uh, on the pipeline as well in the in the future. Okay, awesome. okay so l before uh, I get to, to answer uh, the question on my presentation, I would like um, to tell something about uh, corporate profits and whether um, we should think that uh, the transmission mechanism and the monetary policy really have nothing to do with it. In general, I uh, connect the increase in profit margin and corporate prof uh, profits uh, to the supply chain bottlenecks. And the way in which I see it is that there has been an effect on competition. Uh, typically, uh, suppliers uh, always favor uh, their uh, larger customers. They are uh, harder to replace, uh, is, uh, and there is a uh, lot of literature uh, in different periods of time showing this mechanism. Of course, uh, in that, uh, monetary policy has nothing to do with it, and uh, antitrust uh, should uh, think more of vertical relationship. But then uh, from Governor De Coste, we also saw that the financial constraints and the transmission mechanism have been hitting more uh, small firms. So if we adapt the shocks of supply chain shortages and the fact that the small firms are naturally more affected by the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, we can see that monetary policy could actually amplify the effect on corporate profits. So now let's uh, come to uh, the questions on my pre um, presentation. First, equity transfer. Yes, of course, the equity transfer was the very reason why the policy was designed, to try to mitigate the uh, negative effect of the negative interest rate policy on bank profits. Now, all these mechanisms through which the tiering could have affected the bank behavior are uh, nonlinear function of the excess liquidity holdings uh, of the banks. So think of the banks uh, that uh, should have uh, changed their behavior the most if uh, the main effect was a, a wealth effect. Well, those were precisely the bank that could immediately feel 100% of their exemptions. Was that a fact at, at work? Yes, of course, those banks experienced a higher return upon the announcement of the policy and actually immediately after the conference uh, when Draghi hinted to the possible adoption of the tiering. But overall, the effect was small. So if we focus on those banks, we don't see any change in their lending behavior. The banks that changed their lending behavior most was, were the ones that didn't have much to save in terms of a negative interest rate payment on their excess reserves, precisely because they didn't have much of them. Now regarding the, fr the fragmentation. 
So, of course, uh, our um, results and the analysis that we do on the money market suggest that uh, fragmentation has, um, was uh, sort of decreased by uh, the adoption of the tiering. And uh, my understanding is that uh, the con uh, one of the concerns and objective uh, in uh, the adoption of uh, the new um, operating uh, um, framework of the ECB has been uh, precisely to stimulate uh, activity in the money market. And for instance, uh, the Swiss National Bank continues to have uh, the tiering also above the uh, zero lower bound. And the reason is precisely to uh, stimulate uh, trading. And uh, this is uh, something that is intuitive if uh, banks uh, have uh, different marginal returns on reserves, uh, will uh, trade uh, more. And then is uh, fragmentation in terms of trading um, a concern? Well, there is some trading, perhaps uh, in the data we looked at, wasn't uh, overwhelming, but at the end uh, we look at prices and uh, it looks like that uh, at the moment uh, there, aren't, uh, you, uh, there isn't a huge divergence in prices, but I think that's a very different story and uh, is uh, credibility and uh, is uh, whatever it takes. Yeah, um, one direct question to me, uh, two remarks on, on other questions that came up. Uh, if you look at the numbers for the euro area, um, if you look at corporate profit market margins, and uh, there's been a couple of times where interest rates rose by, say, on average 100 or 200 basis points, uh, average corporate margins compressed in the same year between 1.5% in Germany and 2.5% in France for 100 basis points increase. So having done 300 to 400 basis points in the course of one to two years, the knock-on effect is likely going to be much larger on corporate profit margins. Uh, and if rates stay higher for longer, there's a year two effect as well. So I think stay tuned. Corporate profit margins are, at the moment, giving you a different picture than the equity market, which prices a lot of things in that haven't yet materialized. But I think you will see weakness in corporate profit margins, both in the US and in Europe, develop over the next year or two, in particular if rates don't reverse to previous levels quickly. Um, second, on uh, the question on overinsurance, um, it's nothing to do with overinsurance. Uh, the problem is free insurance when the accident has happened. Insurance usually is about a potential risk, not about a risk that has materialized. And on the deposit side, people have actually been paid a risk and an insurance premium after the accident has happened, uh, clients were bailed out. And so there are a couple of ways to fix that. And you know, the first one, most of these come from central banks selling puts. If something happens in the market, we will step in. That's good, ex post, but it creates more dangerous driving as this more riskier behavior becomes priced in to the long run consequences of riskier behavior. If there is always a put in the central bank steps in, it creates more risky behavior. So, First recommendation would be stop selling puts. You're not in that business. Let the financial sector do that. Second, change the free aspect of the insurance. Charge for the insurance if you have to step in. And a mechanism to charge for an insurance is known as a federal deposit insurance scheme because the FDIC is funded by the banks and the other banks that are still able to fund will pay for the insurance that the FDIC has to put out for the banks that run into trouble. So no free insurance, no puts, charge for the insurance, create an insurance company that charges the healthier banks for any price they have to pay if there's an accident. That's what insurance is all about. The third one, we just wrote a paper, and I would actually put it at number four, because it's expensive for banks, and as a banker, I wouldn't sort of like to see it come, but in the group of 30, we felt, uh, self-insurance, <clears throat> pre-positioning of collateral that you cannot use for other things. Just put a bigger insurance number there by giving the central bank some more collateral that is hostage in case you run in problem, which means your whole operation becomes more expensive. Okay, that's a way. It's probably number four for me, but not number three. And three, 
create a term structure of deposits and funding that is diverse. That's the most obvious one. If you look at what happened with the deposit runs, the most risky thing is overnight deposits that are completely fungible and can run any time. And when you look at regulation, regulation after the last financial crisis introduced two things. The first one is a short-term liquidity coverage ratio. Some rules about short-term liquidity. And the second one is a long-term net stable funding ratio, again looking at long-term funding needs. But the entire part between is missing. There is no rules about a term structure of liabilities and funding that banks should hold. And, you know, I'm being completely transparent to you now. I'm chairman of a German deposit broker, Raisin, that is working globally exactly on that. Let's create unbreakable term deposits by giving depositors money for term deposits so they forgo the money for a certain time, but they get a remuneration for that. And it, the easiest thing to do is to have funding rules for banks about diversified sources of funding, including deposits, and not just the short and the long end, but an entire maturity structure of liquidity that they need to have in order to fulfill run stress testers under certain run scenarios. So uh, let me end with that. I'm a bit triggered by the fragmentation program because, you know, one of my most beloved program is this intervention of the ECB into the spreads of sovereigns in the Eurozone. Uh, it was a longtime favorite program of mine. And, uh, oh no, I'm, I'm, if the press is here, this was sarcastic, uh, so don't write it. Uh, it's, it's a program that has its challenges, in my view, for many, many reasons. At the moment, fragmentation is no problem. Why? Because the industrial country at the core of the Eurozone, Germany, hasn't grown since the pandemic. Where countries like Italy have grown and accumulated almost 4% over this entire year. You don't get a discussion in Germany at the moment despite the fact that you might make the point that monetary policy, a single monetary policy, is probably least geared for the state of the German economy now, a tradition of education of the Bundesbank for many years is Germans don't complain about that. Mr. Nagel can go out and ask for higher rates, and because Germany has not been growing, there is no negative feedback channel because they understand the value of long-term stability. If it were the other way around and the core would grow like crazy and the periphery wouldn't, you would have that spread discussion. You would probably have a different view on what the ECB should and should not do. But let's enjoy the moment, at least from a peripheral, that Germany is weak and therefore there is not a lot of questions about heterogeneity in the Eurozone. It might not be a permanent fixture of the European Union. Thank you. So. We are beyond our time, so I allow only for very short questions. So, Isabel. I think you just so, I have to press. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for an uh, excellent panel. I have two comments, actually, on uh, Maria Sunta's presentation, which I uh, have found quite interesting. So, um, uh, first, I mean, on your worry about uh, QT, what, what we know is that the uh, liquidity from QE is uh, concentrated uh, in the large banks mainly and in the non-periphery countries. So actually we know that 40% um, uh, of banks in terms of total assets are more or less holding the entire excess liquidity from asset purchases, which I would say in the, uh, goes in the direction of saying that maybe we shouldn't be all too worried about the, uh, the effect of QT that you mentioned. Second, uh, as uh, uh, you probably know, we um, uh, published the outcome of our operational framework uh, last week. And uh, this new framework uh, foresees a demand-driven uh, system where our uh, regular refinancing operations are at the core of liquidity provision, and they are at uh, a fixed rate um, a full allotment. Uh, which actually should go a long way in dealing also with the, with the issues uh, that you mentioned. It should also help with the issue of fragmentation. But importantly, this liquidity is not cost-free because there is, uh, there is an opportunity cost, a cost of carry between you know, the, D, the DFR and the, and the MRO uh, of, of 15 uh, basis points. So what we're doing there is kind of uh, we, we try to, to balance 
uh, these uh, um, uh, so for, uh, for once the provision of stability if you if you want and the lim limitation of volatility the, uh, on the other hand we also want to incentivize um, money market uh, activity but at the same time and this goes to to axel uh, this also helps us uh, of course to to actually run down the monetary policy portfolios which is a monetary policy decision and so that is ongoing and the second question by um Harold Benning from Tilburg University. Um, I agree with your point, Axel, that um, the recent mar banking turbulence last year was not limited to the United States and Switzerland. We shouldn't forget that in the famous weekend, the last weekend of March, when Deutsche Bank, there was a lot of uncertainty that the share price of Deutsche Bank, but actually of all systemically important banks all over Europe, in my country, ING and ABN AMRO, they were all down by 15 to 20 percent. So a confidence crisis was emerging, emerging and it could have gone worse. That brings us, of course, to the concerns about bank solvency and perhaps a question to, um, to Pedro Hernandez. Today, the Financial Times has this big read article about uh, the finalization of Basel III, and that the large banks in the United States are fighting heavily against the full implementation. This is, of course, about the floors, that, uh, that the limitations to the internal models. It goes so far now, it's even on the billboards of sports stadiums, according to the Financial Times. Um, this is very worrying, I guess, and one of the remarks, the concluding remarks of the Financial Times is that if in the US, the finalization of Basel II will not be implemented uh, fully, that this will have an impact in other jurisdictions in the world and that the whole finalization uh, of Basel III process is under peril, is at peril. Um, could you perhaps uh, respond to that, whether you share these concerns? Thank you. Thank you. Maria Sunter, do you want to start? Responding. So that's, um, I uh, basically agree with what uh, Isabel um, just said. I just want to um, reiterate that uh, precisely because uh, liquidity is uh, concentrated, uh, we should have uh, some concern that uh, banks with a relatively lower excess liquid holding uh, surrender them when uh, this operation uh, happen so um, the distribution is as important uh, as uh, the quantity and uh, for sure uh, the opera um, the new operating framework uh, mitigates uh, many of these concerns but uh, it is important uh, to have uh, this uh, mechanism uh, in mind, uh, and I am an academic, so I can uh, highlight the mechanism and uh, then uh, not take decisions. So. Yeah, well, in my case, uh, I mean, I have just simply to repeat what I've say, been saying for the last uh, five years as chair of the Basel Committee. I'm, uh, of course, uh, defending full and timely implementation of, of, Basel, uh, of Basel III. Uh, in, the, in the US case, what it is important to, to understand um, is that the proposal that was made by authorities last year had two uh, legs. One was full implementation of Basel III, but second, there was a gold plating, so, which basically meant that um, the, uh, the initial proposal was to go beyond uh, Basel III, uh, which in the end means that if we ju they just eliminate the gold plating, they will still be uh, with fu uh, in full implementation of, of Basel uh, III, and this is uh, still my expectation. But let me perhaps uh, add a, 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 an additional element. If this is not the case, the wrong reaction by Europe would be to downplay the implementation of Basel III. I think the events in March last year, if anything, if anything, what they emphasize is the importance of uh, financial uh, regulation to be uh, strict. So it would be a very bad decision for Europe to move in that direction if, in the end, the U.S. Uh, doesn't uh, fulfill uh, on, on Basel III. Okay, so let me close the session by thanking and applauding to all contributors. Mm -hmm.